Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Mike Francesa podcast and the Mike Francesa podcast on the Bet Rivers Network is brought to you by Casamigos Tequila. Casamigos Tequila is brought to you by those who drink it. All right, we have a very busy weekend coming up. Yankee home opener today, final four tomorrow, championship game Monday night, and then into the Masters on Thursday. So it's a great time in sports with the NFL draft and the NBA playoffs and obviously uh, hockey and the Stanley Cup playoffs, which are always wonderful, uh, right around the corner. Now, a bit of news before we re- review yesterday and then move to today. Uh, the Knicks learned something that a lot of us suspected from the very beginning, and that was that they wouldn't see Randall again this year. They learn now that they won't. And while some people will consider that a death knell for the Knicks, I do not in any way. Um, the Knicks have showed you that they can win without him. They have showed you that they can play terrific basketball without him. And I think that they can still have a terrific performance and a real good time in the playoffs without him. Now, a couple of things have to happen. Number one, OG has to be healthy. He is critical to what they are going to have to do in the playoffs and his ability to guard multiple positions, and he can shut down multiple positions, is critical. The Knicks are going to rely on a very, very cohesive core of interchangeable parts led by a point guard who is having an all-NBA season and who is not your quintessential point guard because he is a scorer first. So he's not he's your lead guard, but he's not your biggest playmaker. But in this world of how we judge guards, it's very different. He is the lead man, and he is going to have the ball at critical times, and he is a scorer first. But Brunson has had an amazing season, one that will land him on the All-NBA top 15 for sure, probably second team. I know some people will push for first team, but I think that's a little ambitious. But being an NBA second team player means you're in the top 10, which is a tremendous season. So while some will call this a death knell, I do not in the least. Now, I think they need to have a healthy Robinson because of what he can give you and how he can join the rotation and give you meaningful minutes as a primary rebounder offensively, specifically, and defensively, and a rim protector. So he's important. OG is absolutely vital. And he hasn't been healthy in a while, and they need him healthy. Otherwise, it will not work. But when they have to rely on major minutes for guys who wouldn't have gotten them otherwise, and turning guys from secondary to primary roles like Hart. They are willing to do it, and they have showed you they can do it. Last night's game, a perfect example with the fourth quarter they played and the way they moved the basketball last night was emblematic of what they can do and what they can get from their very, very cohesive unit. Basketball isn't about adding more. It's about adding the right pieces. It's about cohesion. The group is always worth more than the individual if you can get the group to do things the right way. And the Knicks can do things the right way. They really can. Now, two things from yesterday. Number one, I was going to come in here and obviously set you set a dire scene as the Nick as the Mets hit the road at 0-6. Here it was the ninth inning. They were being shut out into the eighth inning. They hadn't had a hit yet. They had gone 13 innings, the longest stint in the history of the team from the first game to the second game without a hit. Beta dunked one into the outfield. They didn't score again because they can get nothing out of Nimmo and Lindor right now. They are a combined two for 24, a two for 44, two for 44. 
What Lindon needs is to see a couple of left-handers so he can get his righty swings. He'll get his hits. He'll even hit a home run, and he'll straighten out even better from the left side. When he's predominantly straight left side, he gets into all kinds of trouble because the swing is way off. He's uppercutting the ball and popping everything up. But when you look at Nimmo, Lindor, and Stewart and put them all in the lineup together, they are two for 53, and that is scary. But just as it was about to be bring down the curtain on an 0-6 start on a day where there was nobody in the ballpark and they couldn't hit and they blew a three-run lead in game one and now they didn't score in game two, you were going to and set a scene where they're going to Cincinnati, which has improved, and then four in Atlanta and then come home for six games and then head to L.A. and San Francisco. And this start was going to be a nightmare. And it still might be because they're one and five. As I told you yesterday, I said, most likely the Mets are going to hit the road at 1-5 and five because most doubleheaders are split. And this one was thanks to Pete Alonzo. Again, Pete Alonzo. The Mets have had three bats that have joined the fun this year. More take two. He's hit a lot of line drives that have been caught and hit a bunch of balls into the wind. Um, Alonzo has hit, Alvarez has hit, Beatty's hit, and Marte's swung the bat well. Other than that, forget the rest. Especially Nimmo and Lindor, who have been nightmarish. Instead, he homers. The Mets rally for a run, get a walk-off base hit from Taylor, and they get a chance to give their new manager a chance to take a big, deep breath and just relax because he's finally got a win. There's no more Ziggy there, and it took a while, but they finally got a win, and that propelled them onto the road trip feeling a thousand percent better than they would have at 0 6. And again, who else was it? Same guy it always is, it was Alonzo. And that's why I keep telling you, I would try very hard not to give Alonzo a contract that took him into his later or mid to later thirties. But I would give him a five-year deal at a going rate that would make him happy and lock him up because he has been and will be exactly what you want out of a slugging right-handed first baseman who plays every day, can hit in the clutch, hits big home runs, is enormously productive and likes to play here in the pressure. Don't lose that. It's not easy to find. He has earned that contract. The fact that everyone thinks that he's just going to leave of his own volition or get traded out of here in you know, the middle of the season, either one is not what makes sense. Go add a big slug in outfield the next year. Go after Soto. Go after the two top starting pitchers who are on the market next year. That's fine. Makes plenty of sense. More power to you. But don't cut this guy who is without question the foundation, the heart, and the soul of this team in every way. And when you get a guy who's a right-handed slugger who plays every day, every day, and hits consistently with Hall of Fame power. Let him hit his 400 home runs here. Don't send him packing and watch him do it somewhere else. Now, I told you yesterday we were going to have a terrific NIT final, and I didn't know how good. Great playoff game. Two teams that wanted it badly. A game of runs. I mean, Seton Hall did everything right in the first half, playing what was essentially a home game in Hinkle against Indiana State. Place was full. Place was nuts for Indiana State. Indiana State's a beautiful offensive team, but they had trouble with the ruggedness and the physicality and some of the quickness of Seton Hall. Seton Hall gets an 11-point lead, and Dawes gets his third foul. And Dawes is the key. Richmond's got to do his thing. Davis does his thing. 
but Dawes is the key. And when Dawes went out, they scored the last 11 points Indiana State did and went to the half tied, and you thought, oh, boy. And you look at it, and Seton Hall's in foul trouble, and they don't have a bench. And Dawes already got three. And the second half, we had a run and a run until the final run. Indiana State hits two bomb threes. And the difference in the game is them making these long threes. And now they're up 77-70 with 150 left. And it looks like it's going to be a tall order for Seton Hall. And Richmond gets an offensive basket and puts it back in 77-72. And Dawes drives to the basket and gets fouled, makes both free throws, clutch free throws to make it 77-74. He didn't miss a free throw all night last night on his way to the MVP. And after another Indiana State miss, and this Indiana State team, including two big misses from Avila, one where he came up early in the shot clock and shot a, shot a wide open three, which he thought he would make to end the game with a dagger, and he missed it. They missed their last six threes, Indiana State did. Dawes didn't miss the one he had to make. He comes down and ties it at 77. Indiana State can't score. Seton Hall comes down. They get the basket to go ahead. They play defense. Indiana State calls timeout with 8-1 left. Go for a three. It gets blocked. It gets knocked outside. They get a couple more looks, and it doesn't happen. And Seton Hall wins, scoring the last nine points of the game. Towards the MVP, 24 points. Wonderful, wonderful game. Terrific tournament-style game from two teams that, did yes, did belong in the NCAA tournament. So I told you yesterday I thought it would be a very close game. I thought Seton Hall would win by a bucket. They won by a bucket. They did it the hard way. They scored the last nine points of the game to do it. And Dawes was voted the MVP as he should have been through, because throughout the entire NIT, he made every, every big shot. And when he was off the floor, they were lost because they needed him to bail them out time and time and time again, and he did. So a wonderful win for Seton Hall. Congratulations. Indiana State put up their end. Good performance and a wonderful NIT. And now that leads us to today where we have a big event and then tomorrow the Final Four. Listen, whether you have grown up a Yankee fan your whole life, grown up in a Yankee family, you know, think you bleed pen stripes, the whole thing, you know, or you just can't stand the franchise and you hate just hearing the word Yankee, you know something you have to admit if you have any knowledge of baseball, and that is things the Yankees do on the grand stage are special because they're the Yankees. That's, I mean, it's just the way it is. It's just, it's just fact. You can ignore it. You can try it, ignorantly to dispute it, but it's a fact. And when they come off a West Coast where, or a road trip to open the season where they played that well, there's going to be a little added glee in their home opener today. They're going to get a day they can open with, although it's going to be cold. They're still going to be able to play. And the Yankees are going to welcome some new heroes into the fold, including including their new right fielder, who they can't wait to throw their love to and show him how much he wants to spend the rest of his career in pinstripes. This is going to be a special day for Soto. It's going to be a big day for Verdugo. It's going to be a very big day for the guy on the mound who's a local kid who gets a chance to debut in pinstripes throwing the Yankee home opener in Stroman. After last year's debacle and the move for Soto and the other moves they made, there was incredible optimism that the Yankees were back. 
no matter how hard and critical you were, you had to admit that they were back. Now, they've taken some hits, especially the coal hit, which we still don't have the answer about what type of hit it is. But there's reason to worry about the starting rotation. There's reason to worry about the age of some of their regulars, like LeMayu, who's on the shelf, like Rizzo, like Stanton. That's a concern. Also, Holmes is a concern. Let's be honest. Holmes got off that road trip with a win and three saves, and he easily, easily could have had two blown saves, should have had two blown saves, if not for a play by Soto in the outfield. And just some incredible defense by Birdie to take away the Altuve double and then have the ball land foul when it needed to, not go out of the park when it needed to, and then wind up in the glove of Verdugo when it needed to. He hasn't fooled anybody. He's given up six hits in four and a third innings. That's not how you close. But right now, he's the guy. And on the other side, Hamilton has looked really good. He struck out seven over his five and two-thirds innings. He's only given up a hit, no walks. He's looked very, very good. Some of the young guys have looked good. Volpe's gotten off to a nice start. Cabrera's gotten off to a real turnaround start. So there's a lot of reason for optimism, and they will blow the roof off the place today to show you how happy they are that they believe the Yankees are back. Don't think they won't hit some rough spots this year. They will. Don't think this team is on an express to the World Series because it's not. Is it on an express to the playoffs? Well, logic dictates with the firepower they have and their ability to add pieces if they need to. You would think that is a foregone conclusion. They will not allow that to happen this year after last year, not after 82 and 80. So without any question, this will be a an opening day bolstered by the 6-1 and one start and bolstered by the presence of Soto and bolstered by an optimism which they haven't had at the home opener in years. So it should have a very, very special feel to it, and it should be a very special moment for Stroman, who has become a very key piece now that Cole has gone down. How he pitches at the stadium is going to be key. This guy is a professional pitcher. He is a consistent pitcher. He's a professional pitcher. He is going to pitch well on the road, I have no doubt. The question is, how is he going to pitch in the confines, the friendly confines for left-handed hitters at Yankee Stadium? That remains to be seen. And we will see chapter one today. So for Yankee fans... As you hear this, as you head to the ballpark, as you scurry early on this day that is more holiday than anything else for you, this day you wait and mark on the calendar as soon as the schedule comes out. What I'm doing this day, Yankee home opener, and have it happen after a West Coast swing where they played wonderful baseball. And even put the finishing touches with that dramatic win that featured Judge swinging the bat while getting a double and a homer and Verdugo hitting a huge two-run homer and then finding a way to win a game that looked like it could be in trouble a couple of times in the balance. So everything is there for this to be a very, very warm and special day. For Yankee fans. You know what? After last year, enjoy it. 
Enjoy it. Yes, Yankee fans get a little ahead of themselves. Yes, they get a little obnoxious. Well, they're basically obnoxious anyway. We all know that. Their expectations are always high, and their feeling of superiority always is even higher. They don't consider other teams on their level, and let's be honest. For the long history of the sport, there hasn't been anybody in the league. But in the recent history of the sport, they have left a lot to be desired, and they hope today to start to change that. And they also hope today to start their campaign to explain to Soto why he wants to spend the rest of his career in the South Bronx and not, say, in City Field or some other neck of the woods after his very aggressive agent takes him free agent which he will. So all that begins today and all I would say is enjoy. Because you did live through a rough one, a very rough one for Yankee fans last year. All right, it hasn't been, it hasn't been an enormously exciting NCAA tournament. I've been around the NCAA tournament since the days of Bill Walton. Uh, I worked it starting in the early 80s. That's a very long time ago. I've been around it my whole life. And I'd be the first to admit this one lacked for charm. It lacked for drama. It was about the heavyweights. And as we start the final four, it's still about the heavyweights. It's about Edie and whether the player of the year, the 7-4 big man, can lead his Boilermakers to a national title. And it's about UConn, this mighty force looking to become the first school since Florida to repeat something that is very, very difficult to do, especially in these modern times of chaotic college basketball. But this UConn team, believe it or not, is even better than the one that ran roughshod through the NCAA tournament last year. It's even better. And it's been even more dominant. They have played four games so far. UConn has. They have led each of the games at some point by 30 points. In basketball terms, that is absurd. What happens is if you have a momentary lapse, if you have a momentary drought, which most teams do, you pay for it, not just pay for it with a couple of points or a swing in the lead, you pay for it with the game being basically put out of reach. Illinois got off to a rough start. Shannon realized right away he was going to have trouble getting to the basket. Illinois decided they were going to attack Klingon, and he basically was intimidating them off the floor. But they came back, and they got the game tied at 23, and you said, wait a second. This team, which can provide some matchup problems, has really jumped back into this game. And then they hit a lull. And the next thing you know, UConn was up 30. We're talking about 30 straight points against one of the five or six best teams in the country. That's scary. I thought all along, and this wasn't any great revelation, but I thought all along and hoped all along that we would get UConn Purdue in the final because I wanted to see the battle of the big men. I've known all along that the UConn team is stronger and deserves to be favored and will be favored in the game and deserves to be favored in the game. But I have wanted to see Edie, who has offensive abilities and can be a force offensively because he can foul out your team, foul out your big man, 
and get to the line so much that they can just dominate the game. You try to double him, and then he swings it to those three-point shooters who didn't in the Tennessee game, but usually knock down a good number of threes. If they had in the Tennessee game and made their free throws, it wouldn't have been a six-point game. It would have been a 16-point game. Now, the Cinderella role in this tournament has been played by a team that is anything but a Cinderella, let's be honest. I mean, NC State is not a Cinderella team. They're an ACC team. But a NC State team many years ago played a Cinderella role. And they were a Cinderella because they came up a team came up against an unbeatable force in Olajuwon's five slam, Olajuwon, Clyde Drexler, Larry Mishore, et cetera. That five slam a jammer team, which beat Louisville in a game that they felt would revolutionize basketball, which it didn't. But the feeling was that that five slam a jammer team was unbeatable. And they beat the unbeatable team. And they were a very strong Cinderella who really wasn't a Cinderella because they spend their world in a big conference. They came from the ACC. How can an ACC team be Cinderella? But that's what's been portrayed here, and that's what will be portrayed on Saturday again as NC State will be a nine-and-a-half point on the dog when they take the court against Purdue. Now, this NC State team has gotten off – you know, stunned everybody, got the miracle shot against Virginia to stay alive in the ACC tournament, won the ACC tournament, came into the tournament. Most people thought they could go out in the first week. They didn't. On Sunday, they almost went out against Oakland. They went to overtime and won the game. They came back against Marquette. Everyone liked Marquette. NC State beat them. They came back against Duke. Everybody liked Duke, including me, and, Duke, and they beat Duke. Burns dominated Duke. And their defense dominated Duke, and Duke played a terrible game. As well as they played against James Madison, that's how badly they played against NC State. But here's the problem I have tomorrow. What Burns has done in the tournament as the new round mound, now he's not the round mound of rebound because he's not Charles Barkley, and he's not a big-time rebounder. He is more of a scorer and facilitator. But they run their stuff through him, and Duke had no answer as he went 13 for 19 from the floor and scored 29 points and really put them away in the second half with basket after basket, which they couldn't stop. But This is a guy who cannot go outside and drain the jump shot. It's not his game. His game is to feel his opponent on his body, bounce him off, create space with his largesse, and then with a soft touch, send it home from seven or eight feet or bank it home. None of that will work against Purdue. They have a 7-4 presence inside. Now, what I would do if I was NC, if I was Purdue is I would start by playing Burns in a tricky manner. I don't know what his plan is against Edie. My guess is he's going to try and pull Edie a little farther out and see if he can get around him. It's not going to work. He's not fast. His game is based on bumping his opponent, gaining angles, and then gaining ability to fall back and knock his shot down. It's not going to work. Edie won't move, and Edie will just knock his shot back. The worst thing he could have is a rim protector that's 7-4 going against him. It doesn't work for him there. And I wouldn't even keep Edie on him all the time because of the fact that Edie would be more efficient against Burns when he would be coming to help. Now, you have to watch who you leave open on that team. 
because a lot of the guys they put on the floor, including both guards, are going to be able to knock down threes. You're not leaving them. You're not going after them with the guards. This is a big, big situation. And unless they put four three-point three shooters on the floor, it'll work fine. So whether he plays them straight up or plays them just as a defensive, you know, protector back there, either way, he is going to take away Burns' game. If you take away Burns' game, you take away most of what NC State is. NC State facilitates through O'Connell. His game is very underrated. In the championship game, in the regional final against Duke, he had 11 rebounds and six assists. That's a brilliant floor game. And he doesn't make many baskets, but they, when they make them, they're big. When he makes a dagger, it sticks. That's been his thing. He doesn't shoot much, but when he does, it matters. But he runs a lot of what they do. And they expect Horn to knock down a ton of shots. Again, they have their hands full with this Purdue group. But the problem is they can't just toss the ball into Burns and have Burns bail them out. It's not going to work. On the other end of the floor, they have no chance, no answers. They are not anywhere near the defensive team that Tennessee was, and Tennessee couldn't handle it. And Tennessee had Connect have a game that was unbelievable and keep them in the game. There's no way NC State gets anybody to play as well as Connect played against Purdue. And it still wasn't enough. Because Edie is going to get the ball. He is going to foul your whoever you put near him into foul trouble. He is going to go to the line extensively, or you're going to double him, and he is going to leave guys open for that's going to leave guys open for wide open threes, and they're going to bang them down and beat you. They have three guys who can shoot 45 percent from three. Any way you cut this, this is a terrible, terrible matchup for NC State. The only thing they could do would be to get out and run with the rebounds or run with turnovers. I don't see them turning for do over a lot. And they are going to need all their manpower going to the boards or they are going to get killed on the boards. They have no idea what the force is here. Edie's coming off a game against Tennessee where he scored 40 points, and if he had shot well from the foul line, he would have scored 50 points. He is an unstoppable force here in this game, and he is not going to be stopped anywhere short of Monday night. Now, Monday night, we're going to spend time on that game because that game is going to be a fascinating matchup, and I can't wait for it. I can't wait to see Klingon against Edie and everything that that game will bring. And I will feel cheated if I don't get that game. Listen, I don't, I picked Alabama to go to the final four. It turns out to look like a great pick. It was a little bit lucky because I did it on process of elimination. I didn't like NC. I didn't like Arizona all year. I didn't like Baylor. I didn't think Michigan State would beat Carolina. I thought it was a terrible matchup. That left me with nobody in that whole bracket except Alabama, which was a great shooting team. That I thought last year had gotten cut short because of all the Miller stuff with the law. It had ruined that team. And this year, maybe they would get things to break their way, and they had a lot of talent. And I knew Sears could dominate, and he has dominated. And they got the great performance that they needed to get from a role player against NC, and that's how they got past NC. And then they handled Clemson, which I thought they would. They made 16 threes in the Clemson game. To stay in the game against... To stay in the game against UConn, they will have to make 25 threes. 
at least 20. 25 might be rough in a college game. Say 20. They'll have to make at least 20. And I think they would probably might have to make a couple more. They're going to have to singe the nets at such a level. And it's not going to happen. I am very solid that Purdue will face a very emotional NC State team and will just methodically edge out to where at the end of the game they'll win double digits. Because they'll keep fouling Purdue late and Purdue will make enough free throws to and make enough shots to, to do what they have to do and win the game going away in double digits. I am really afraid of the next game because there's no way for Alabama to play that game except to attack. It's their only game. And their only game doesn't work. They can't tempo. That's not who they are. What they do is they try to beat you down the floor, play you at a pace, and get a mismatch for a guy to get a three open or be able to drive to the basket. They want to create mismatches, whether they're smalls on, on immobile bigs or there are guys who can get inside on their defender. Alabama can score on anybody. I don't doubt that for a second. Sears can make threes from anywhere on the floor. He is as dangerous a three-point shooter as there is anywhere in the country. But again, and you've heard this time and time and time and time again, UConn has no weaknesses. There's nothing they can't do. They can play you inside. They can play you outside. They can play you offensively. They can play you defensively. They can play you slow. They can play you fast. They can play through the big man. They can play through the guards. They are lethal. No matter what you do, they will do it better. They have big-time players. Spencer is a terrific college player who is the intensity of that team, who will make open threes and who will take you in the lane and score inside a lot more than people realize. Newton can do everything. But the real key is Castle is a great basketball talent. There's nothing he can't do. He can play above the rim. He can shut you down defensively. He can make a three. He can go in and dunk over your head. He is a guy who, without question, will be a lottery pick. He is an incredible talent. And when he became a big part of this team, this team went to a different level. All their pieces work unbelievably. You know what Klingon is and what Klingon's going to do to Alabama, offensively and defensively. You know what Caravan does, okay? He moves the ball. He can make threes. He can go inside. There's nothing. His game is versatile, inside and out. He has size. He can shoot threes. He does everything that you can want. He can pass. Newton can get two points. He can get 20 points. He can get a triple-double. Nothing he can't do. Same thing for Castle. Castle can play a great game without scoring. Playing great defense, getting rebounds, getting assists. Then when he gets a little guard on him, he scores over him. Diera is a trigger off the bench. He will make open shots, do not leave him open. And then they put Johnson in, and all Johnson does is catch lobs for dunks. When he's in for Klingon. Stewart's the eighth piece. They have nothing else. They only go eight deep. They don't ever need more than that. But Klingon, Spencer, Caravan, Newton, and Castle are as good a college five as you will find 
in a very long time. Alabama doesn't have an antidote for what UConn does. And they're going to play at a pace that's just going to make it harder for them to beat UConn. It's a bad matchup. But, hey, I thought that Illinois was even, I know that the coaching staff at UConn thought that Illinois was a very unique, unusual, and dangerous matchup. And they buried them. They absolutely buried them. Shannon was on an incredible tear going into that tournament, going into that game. He shot two for 12 and scored eight points, and a couple of them came at garbage time. He scored eight points. He was averaging 31 in his last eight games. He scored eight. It was scary what they did to Illinois. I've watched them in person this year. I saw them play St. John's twice. I actually saw St. John's play them that close game in the Big East tournament. And it was cosmetically close, yes, but they kept turning UConn over late. And it wound up being a five-point decision, even though they never were threatening to win the game. They didn't get manhandled the way these other teams have gotten manhandled. So do I give Alabama a punch's chance? No. I don't give them any chance. I think if the game's 100 to 80 or 90 to 75, they did a great job. I can't see it any closer than that. And if they push the pedal, which I think they will because that's who they are, I think the game's going to get up around 100 for UConn. Now, remember in their first game, Alabama scored 109. So they're not afraid to score. The Carolina game was approaching 90 for both teams. So, And they had real lulls in that game. Uh, there can be plenty of points in this game, but it doesn't matter. At the end of the game, UConn's going to have 20 more than Alabama has. But what else is new? NC State has a better chance at that than Alabama does at springing the upset. But what we are looking at here is the culmination of what this entire tournament has been. When this tournament started, I said to you, there's been three teams that have dominated college basketball. UConn, Purdue, and Houston. Houston isn't the same team. They're banged up, and they went on to lose their great player, which was very unfortunate. They might be right here in the Final Four. They only lost by three without him. UConn was bet, ahead better than everybody else, which is what I said all year, and will win another championship, which I still think they will. But the one thing was you wanted to see UConn, just from a basketball standpoint, just from a spectator standpoint, you want to see UConn have to earn something, have to play in the final minutes of a championship game. And Purdue, at least with the presence of Edie, who I do believe, and I don't want to get into the analysis of that game because I'm so looking forward to it, I will do it on Monday. I'll do it on Monday morning. It'll be up early, and you can look and listen to it well before the game is played. I really am fascinated by what will go on there. And really, I'll tell you, I do believe that Klingon will be so excited that he will get in early foul trouble against Edie. But that will just create another set of problems for Purdue when that happens. Now, Edie can score. Listen, he got 40 the other day, and it could have easily been 50 against a tremendous defensive team. We might not have seen his high watermark yet at 40. Although he did go to the foul line 22 times in that game. Now he was 14 to 22, and he missed, a, a, he, he missed some one-on-ones that really hurt Purdue. And 
I don't understand why Purdue wants to use him to break pressure in the final minute because why would you want him on the line? You have three guys shooting over 84%. Come on, get them the ball. Don't have Edie put in that situation in a one-point game. You don't want that. You want to throw it to him, throw it into him in a one-point game and let him take it to the basket, but you don't want him really to go to the line just because he caught the ball to break the pressure. Because his foul shooting, while the most part good, you know, in a big spot can be erratic. He scored 40 points against a really good defensive team. And don't for a second think that Tennessee did not play a heck of a game against Purdue. They did. They played a wonderful game. But it still wasn't enough because he wound up with 40 points and 16 rebounds. That's hard to overcome. You know, that's hard to overcome in a game at that score. It's very hard to overcome that kind of game. You know, when a team scores 72 points and the guy gets 40, he's impacting the game rather dramatically. Now, that day, Connect scored 37. He had an incredible game. But he took 31 shots. That's the one thing. He had to really take... Edie scored 40, only took 21 shots. He took 31 shots to score 37. But it was really the Edie block on Connect because they missed the free throws. Edie missed three or four over two trips. And he shot an air ball. He looked tired. Connect came down, drove it to the basket, hoping to get a three-point, conventional three-point play, and put up the floater, which could have cut it to three. And he blocked it to a Purdue player, and the game was over with 20 seconds left. It was a huge block, a very big play in the game. And those two players who were both, you know, player of the year candidates, Edie's the winner, but Connect was one of the final four, both played as well as you can play in a regional final. I mean, a 40-point, 37-point performance in a regional final is a great performance. NC State can't keep him from doing the same thing. He is going to foul guys out and put guys in serious foul trouble if they try to go near him. Now, Burns isn't playing defense anyway. So he has no thoughts of being able to play against. He, he, he has no, he has thoughts offensively. He has no defensive misgivings. He does not think he's going to do anything against them, nor does he want any part of them defensively. But the problem is the way his offense works, it's going to be negated by a 7-4 guy inside completely. So unless NC State just bombs away and hits a incredible multitude of threes, they're going to have a very, very hard time staying in the game. And remember, Tennessee lost by six. It should have been more. Purdue missed a lot of open threes, and they missed a lot of free throws, which they're usually better at. This, NC State's not going to get a player score like Connected. He's not going to get a 37-point performance out of anybody. It's going to be very hard for them to stay in this game. So while we have had the one seeds dominant, you know, Purdue has covered the spread every game. NC, uh, UConn has covered the spread every game. The favorites in the first four days of this tournament had a run where if you're a chalk player, you basically had your best tournament ever because the favorites were winning and scoring and opening up margins at huge levels. This tournament that a lot of people said was going to be the most competitive ever because there was so much balance in college basketball, well, there was no balance at the top. These teams ran roughshod through the tournament. And 
I will not be the least bit surprised if the two teams run roughshod through the Final Four to get to the final game. Because to me, we've been getting to this game since January. Houston wasn't healthy enough and didn't shoot it well enough. They had lost some key components. They played very valiantly. They had upset potential, but I still think it was going to be UConn and Purdue. And I've been thinking about that battle of that big men for a long time. Been hoping to see it. Now, I do agree that it's not completely fair because of the fact that UConn's supporting cast is better. That goes without argument. But Purdue's is not chopped liver. And we have a chance to get a really good game there. And I, for one, having watched this UConn team a lot this year, like I said, I've seen them in person multiple times. I've seen them in person three times. I've watched them on TV countless times. I would like to see them in a close game just to see how they operate. I expect them to operate really well, but I just like to see it because their games are always over. So final four tomorrow, and it opens up obviously a great time. So you got the Yankee home opener today. You have the final four tomorrow. You have the championship game Monday night. And then the real annual ride of spring and one of the great events on the sports calendar, the Masters, on Thursday. So looking forward to the Masters. Always look forward to the Masters. You know, the Masters just comes and goes too quickly because the anticipation for it is enormous. I love the Masters. I love watching the Masters. I've been lucky enough to go twice. Um, but the best seat, don't ever feel cheated because the best seat on Saturday and Sunday is in your living room. If you ever have a chance to go, go Friday and Thursday and Friday. Saturday and Sunday, the best seat is in front of your television without any question because you want to be able to cover the whole thing. And I sat one year, I sat in the 18 Tower the entire day on Sunday. I went to Butler Cabin early. Uh, I came with, uh, obviously with Jim Nance and spent the day with him. I was there all week. I, on Sunday, I went up in the tower with him. And when you go up in the tower, you stay there. And you can see nine and 18. I mean, nine out one side, 18 out the other side. So I saw everybody play nine. I saw everybody finish 18. And it's an amazing, amazing thing to do. But you need on Sunday to capture the entire tournament because the back nine on Sunday, usually somebody's mounting or two or three guys are mounting a huge charge. The tournament is up for grabs. How are you going to play those par fives? What are you going to do on number 12? All that stuff that comes into that tournament and then the tough finishing holes. I mean, it is so special. And nothing looks like that place looks. I mean, it looks like it looks like, you know, perfection. The water is the bluest blue. The azaleas are the most beautiful colors. The grass is the greenest green. The whites are the whitest white. I mean, it, it, it's something out of like a fantasy land. But what's great about it is, as golf fans, you know the course. You know what has to be done when they hit 12 and 13 and 15, etc. And 
often you don't know the golf course, even at a major. You haven't lived that golf course year after year after year and shot after shot after shot. So the golf course and the recognition factor for the average golf fan is so strong that he, he knows the course and he understands what the golfer has to do. And it makes it that much more enjoyable as they all move and that leaderboard starts flying around and you hear the roars on Sunday. That all begins on Thursday. And I know golf's had a rough time and it really has. And I've been its severest critic. I think what they've done to the sport is shameful. But we can put all that aside. Because next week, after we crown a champion in college basketball, after we have the Yankee opener today, is the Masters. We'll see you later.